precision. 365 days, that means a year in the metaverse, gamify, and crypto space. I'm very happy to invite here Dia Yatsio from Animoca Brands and Gaurav from TDFi, who will be asking all the most delving questions, right? Please enjoy. <laughs> and did you invite all of these? Yes, yeah. sure. Oh, you, we didn't hear. <laughs> I'd like to reinvite Yat. Uh, please have a stage. We are honored to have you today. And um, as the topic says, this won't be, this is very usual to TDFi. We are not exciting. We are pretty old, you know, orthodox uh, stuff that works in the real world like that, right? So we'll discuss enterprises more than anything. Yeah, if you can, I think everyone wants to know the journey of the Asia's largest investor, as they have claimed you recently. Give us, give us an intro in your own words. What has been your journey? What do our founders have to learn from you? What is one lesson or two lessons or three, whatever, that you want to give to all these founders that are looking at a career in Game 5 where you started, I guess, eight years ago, nine years? So I leave it to you to introduce yourself. Hello? Okay, great. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you for hosting. It's incredible what you've built here. Uh, so to, to, for your question, Animoca Brands itself really started getting into the particularly non-fungible token space in late 2017, which seems like an eternity ago. Uh, and unlike perhaps uh, many other crypto peers, you know, we didn't enter because of Bitcoin. We actually entered really because of NFTs, because of the fact that we you know, culture spoke to us. That, that was the main emphasis and focus. Today, Animoca Brands has over 380 portfolio companies, but we're also the creators or, and also um, um, owners of companies like Sandbox or Phantom Galaxies, Rev, the Rev token, and, and a series of other projects that we're doing. And really, maybe as a message to the founders and the way that we entered the space, when we started building and seeing something, we thought digital ownership was going to be the real big revolution. And I think the message for this is really that um, if you build something with impact and purpose, if you believe in this strongly enough, then frankly speaking, it doesn't really matter that there's a that is difficult to build. In 2018, 2019, you might remember for some of you, you know, Bitcoin was like three thousand dollars, <laughs> Ethereum was like a hundred, right? I mean, that was really a really bad time. Yeah. Uh, but actually, that's when the best companies are being built because Absolutely. yeah, because the people who are building during that time. That's when we basically invested and participated in companies like OpenSea and Axie Infinity and uh, Wax, Dapper Labs, Decentraland, all of those companies. Uh, that's actually during the winter, or ice age perhaps you would say, where we actually saw the opportunity to support them and grow them at the time. Uh, and here we are today. I would say the markets changed completely. Uh, despite some, what some people say, this actually feels much more positive than say even say three years ago. And, you know, while a lot of people don't understand the guts, there are better words, but from a stage, I would say the guts it needs to first decide to invest in those markets. When, you know, I'm sure no matter how big the organization is, there is definitely a struggle in bad markets. So it needs guts to think about investing, giving away your money. It takes guts to believe in a company that no one else is believing in, right? So definitely those who those who have lived that life feel the pain and then obviously the reward comes so from here guys we'll switch hyper institutional side more enterprise cause something that really changed my perspective towards metaverse was six months ago so i said okay well there's hype metaverse has a future let's have some metaverse game five companies the name says it all we are tt5 we want to do banks, we want to bring DeFi to the world, problems that are of the real world, not, a, not the problems that are created by blockchain itself. But, uh, so yeah, we, we had a couple of companies like uh, Vulcan Forge and so on. And then I just started receiving messages on LinkedIn, on WhatsApp, from larger enterprises, especially from consultants, the Deloitte's and the PwC's of the world, uh, that they, they are looking at metaverse, their clients are going crazy about metaverse. And they're asking, 
very, very legit questions, like deep questions. So I said, probably there's something I'm missing. And that's the day I sort of took a, a minute to reflect upon what is it happening, right? And this is how I phrased my first question. It's based on my perception. So you can totally deny, totally outrule, or agree, whatever, right? So the dot-com era started with a few websites like Rediff, AOL, and Yahoo, trying to list everyone and everything on themselves. Still later, after a decade, businesses and even individuals had their own sites. The evolution after the bubble burst, right? So I'm looking at a similar trend with metaverses, where a few metaverses are bringing larger businesses to a portion of their construct, like you just met. Do you think the metaverse industry will same, face a similar fate? So it's like, right now everyone is saying, I know how to build a metaverse. You don't know, you come to my. And hence the bigger companies are jumping into them. I think there will be a bubble burst or a settlement of dust, uh, probably after the winters as usual. And then a lot of people will build a, their own metaverse. I think this is the evolution of website, YouTube, content together, emerging into consumer engagement. So I think the way that we think of the metaverse really is a construction of new economies. So when you think about sort of our belief is digital property rights, right? So property for us is the most important aspect because as an end user, as a user in this community, what is the metaverse? Well, you could argue that really the metaverse began 40, 50 years ago, even or 40 years ago with the early beginnings of the internet when we started going online. And today we live in a world where you know, we spend on average 10 hours a day online, whether it's on Facebook, on Instagram, or, you know, on WhatsApp. So you could argue we're already digital dependents. We already rely on, on those places. But there's one thing, and just to sort of touch on that point, um, it's important, I think, is that we're generating a really valuable resource in the online space, in the online time, and that is data. And that data paradigm is the resource of the metaverse. In the physical world, we would, you know, we would fight for oil, we would fight for land, but in the digital world, we fight for data. There's one difference though, is that in the current kind of pre-metaverse that we live in, it's ruled by the Facebooks and the Apples and the Googles. And they actually take our data and they monetize it and they utilize it. So in Web3, in this new paradigm, we have the ability to own that data and then own the derivative value of that data, which we now see with blockchain and NFTs and so on. So to your question, how would that pan out? Well, the first thing that property rights does it decentralizes ownership and therefore also distributes it more fairly. So the example would be instead of having one large, you could argue that Facebook is a kind of metaverse, a kind of economy. It's a monopoly, right? But in actually this new paradigm, there won't be this monopoly. It's going to be broken up. There's going to be, you know, thousands and thousands of them. And the mental model, we think of it like an economy, is, uh, is like a country or a city. So you can't have one New York and you one can't have one Dubai. In fact, the fact that there is a Dubai or an Abu Dhabi or a New York or a Hong Kong, actually that diversity is actually beneficial, not only because they compete with each other, but also because they add value to each other. You know, New York is special because you have many other cities in the world. New York isn't special because it's the only city in the world. It's also boring if it's only the same culture. So we think the metaverse will function the same way because ultimately all of this is about our human time. It's about our human attention. It's about communities. So I think that there's going to be thousands and thousands of metaverses. They don't all have to be very big. They can be small, but they can be the kind of communities that we prefer to be in. And this is the other part. In Web2, in the metaverses that exist in Web2, there is no ability to do capital formation. That's why we're worth only one or two dollars to Facebook, right? I think the average ARPU per user on Facebook is maybe 30 or 40 dollars, right? But in the Web3 world, you can have capital formation the value of your time is worth thousands of dollars or maybe tens of thousands of dollars, like an actual economy. So that's basically our belief is that, you know, maybe like a homepage, there's going to be thousands and thousands of uh, metaverses out there. I, I think we shouldn't miss on your point about cities. Dubai is truly the multicultural hub that it is, right? We live in all the diversities, all the cultures. Um, um, the second question you've actually covered to, to, some, to, to some level, but I want to point it, I want to shoot straight, right? So, you know, we touched upon retail, we touched upon businesses, right? So we are looking at a lot of onboarding on retail audience, off retail audience, on the best of metaverses. 
I mean, everyone's trying to onboard their retail user. But at the same time, there are hyper enterprise approaches to metaverses. These are B2B metaverses, you know, the, the, the education, the corporate metaverses that we were discussing. What is Yat from Animoca putting his bets on? What is on the top of his list? Well, I mean, Animoca Brands has focused very heavily on blockchain gaming initially. Uh, we still do that. I think there's a couple of reasons why. Um, and the other area is education. But let me focus on gaming first. There's about 3.4 billion gamers out there today, uh, which is, you know, two-thirds of the actual internet. And most gamers actually have a relationship with their virtual goods as one of ownership. Whether you ask your children, whether you ask a gamer, you know, that skin that he bought or that item that he's earned or that he's purchased, he doesn't think he's renting it, even though that's what's happening. He thinks he owns it. So you already have an audience of billions of users around the world who actually believe that and want that. So an onboarding, we think, is easier. Now, right now, we've seen with early sort of companies like Axie Infinity or even the Sandbox, those are the beginning, early stages. But really, from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, the most popular game in the world today is still Roblox and Minecraft, right? And actually, those are the environments that people know and understand best, not just because of our children. It's also the adults who play these environments. They also look at the online experiences as real to them. You know, there's real love, there's frustration, there's unhappiness, there's excitement. These are real emotions. These aren't sort of, you know, virtual emotions. They're still real to you as a human. So your virtual time in a game is as real to you as your physical time. So that transition, we think, is logical for that audience. Um, I think the other thing that, just covering quickly on, on the gaming side, that's important is that the value that game companies are generated is you have, gaming is a $200 billion industry today, bigger than music and, uh, and film combined. But a large part of that value doesn't go to the gamers. The value majority goes to either the advertising companies or to the actual game studios. Now, what happens when all of that value goes, a big portion of that value goes back to the player economies, it actually fuels sort of an actual um, um, real sort of the, the metaverse activities that we see. The other area that we like a lot is education. I know you've done something in that area as well. Uh, and the reason why, again, is because our thesis on non-fungible tokens is that all things that are content can now become assets through NFTs. Now, when they become an asset, you can have all the network effects that assets can have, such as capital formation. For instance, if I own an NFT, you can have a loan. If I own an NFT, I can you know, maybe sell it if I want to. If I own an NFT, I can rent it or give it to someone else. These are things you can't do in Web 2. You can do in Web 3. And teachers and educators are amongst the largest content creators in the world, but they don't have the benefit of that capital formation. So we think Web3 could be a good solution for them as well. Of course, of the 380 companies plus we invested in, it's not just those two areas. We've invested in layer one and layer twos. We're at a point where we're investing in the entire ecosystem because just like when you grow an economy, you need to invest in the roads and the streets and everything else. You can't just invest in one business or two. Um, it's, I don't think now is the time to specialize too much. I think you need to invest broadly in the ecosystem as well to help it grow. Points, point well taken. So I, I have a revelation here, uh, an experience to share, and actually that has just happened now. There's a day in life for all those who have made their own money when they realize that they have enough money. And, and while you were speaking, I realized that the day I realized I have enough money was the day when I paid for my first game. I said, I'll no longer struggle with the stupid guns and the stupid things that I have. I'll freaking buy the best gun and win it. Right? It was a sniper game. So you're pretty on spot from the sentiment point of view that the ultimate next level uh, for, for the larger audience of gaming to onboard is to get back there. Secondly, coming from a 15-year background of investing, I have a slight... I wouldn't say contradiction, but a different expression of what you said. Actually, you know what? The money has always been going back to the people. So what has happened in the institutional world, there is capital. They fund the game from their own pocket and they use that money to acquire user. It's called CAC, right? Right now what's happening is anyways, the money that was rotating on the CAC system is going back to the ecosystem. Right? We call it play to earn. Only if it is devised properly, if there are the right financial modelers sitting behind the tokenomics, 
the rather abused words these days, um, and making sure that the CAC is not exceeding a few dynamics like ARPU, and I know these are very technical terms for a non-financial audience, but I think it's the, it's the sole responsibility of the project to find these experts, get their things, their finance sorted, and then run an economy that's sustainable and not just go out throwing away money at yeah. where to earn. So I just want to add on that. So as I mentioned, the gaming industry last uh, sort of this year projected over $200 billion. However, also projected this year is close to $120 billion in app installs, to your point about customer acquisition costs. Now, think about this for a moment. Not even including platform fees like Apple's 30%. More than half of the value that is generated in the gaming industry goes to Facebook, Apple, and Google. How much of that money goes back to the gaming industry? Almost zero. That's the issue. So, so much value is generated, but Apple and Facebook and Google and every one of those advertising companies who sell you ads to attract these customers actually don't invest back into it. This is the highest kind of extraction. And the problem with that is it makes the ecosystem unhealthy which is a reason why you can't have small game developers anymore, because they can't afford it, because they can't pay that kind of money. You can only have the big game companies succeed. But actually what happens is, is that it becomes a very unhealthy ecosystem where even the game companies are arguably dependent on the platform itself. Now, just think about Apple. What is it, four or $500 billion of cash that is basically just sitting there, right? It's actually not contributing back into the economy. It's not going back into the system. And that's what Web3 can change. Because from a user acquisition standpoint, instead of paying Apple and Google you know, this advertising money, you actually incentivize the customer to come play your game by giving you valuable assets that you may or may not wish to sell. Even if they monetize it, a player has a much higher likelihood of contributing back into the ecosystem that he's playing than you know, Apple and Facebook, who would never do that, for instance. So that's the magic of Web3 gaming and blockchain gaming. And you know, many people don't understand this aspect from, you know, they look at Axie Infinity and they look at the prices and say, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't seem to work. But really it's the innovation of how value is transferred to the players. That's the innovation. So I can tell you I'm having goosebumps because this is the fact about Web3 that keeps me awake at night, although I sleep well. Um, but just the phrase as it means, right? This is, this is the true decentralization of power, of wealth that we are looking in the future with Web3. One important thing that I want to focus also, and we are digressing from the questions. I know the organizers stressed on sticking to an agenda instead of questions, but I'm really loving it. So we all remember when Amazon tried to build their own Play Store, launched it on, launched it on Google, obviously no chance on Apple. There are endless, endless um, hustles, I would say, because they're nowhere too close to reality, being done by, I would, I know one $20 billion company, and I don't know how many others are actively trying to resist this, this monopoly of the game centers, but they're defeated at the point of payment. They're defeated at the point where nothing can actually move into that ecosystem and move out. I think Web3 has an answer to that. I think we are already changing it through NFTs. I think we are already changing it through cross-platform uh, assets. How would they, they, they have to understand that because if the user onboarding is fast enough and the user is resistant enough, I don't see a reason why the other games would sustain because here I take my one gun from one game to another gun to another game, right? Yeah, so I think it's an important point here when people talk about digital property rights, actually what property rights in the physical world does, it actually gives you freedom. Now, what I mean by that is it's not just freedom in political terms, it's also freedom in economic terms. For instance, the fact that I own a house and I can sell it is a freedom. Nobody else can tell me that I am not allowed to sell it, for instance, right? That, that flexibility opens it up. So property rights and freedom are very much intertwined and connected. The same is true for digital. If I can have digital ownership of my assets, then I actually have digital freedom. So take the story of Axie Infinity. Axie Infinity didn't become big because they had a strategy to grow in the Philippines, which is where their big market ended up being. It became big because a separate group of people called YGG, the Guild Gaming, uh, Guild Gaming guys, had the freedom of taking the Axies and create a new business model, which is like an Uber-like business model, by renting 
their assets to other players around the to, to other owners around the world who would then utilize it in the Philippines for other players who didn't have money but had time to generate uh, sort of revenue from it in this particular case. So that freedom allowed them to innovate on a new business idea in the same way that, you know, uh, owning assets in the physical world gives you the freedom to do, you know, different services for the ownership of your phone or your clothes or your house, for instance. And, you know, Axie became really big because of that. And here's the other thing. Two million people in the Philippines in that time basically uh, opened a crypto wallet and they don't have a credit card and they don't have a bank account. Beautiful. Right? Yeah. Now, this Amazing. is really interesting. These are not people who are financially educated. They didn't go to college. The typical thing is, oh, I'm not smart enough to do finance. And here you have a case where these people that would be normally financially excluded are now in a financial ecosystem that has come through gaming. And so I think this is the powerful paradigm. It also defeats this argument that there are some people who are too stupid for financial knowledge. You just have to have the right incentives and then they can do it. I think we were just discussing this uh, before we came to the stage. This is again another power that comes through Web3. So you and me, I don't call myself sophisticated enough, but you certainly do qualify. Some sophisticated investors come, in the, come at the top, come in the beginning, structure the deal, the deal goes to the smart contract so that every last investor, every retail investor is coming at the same terms as you. Maybe not the same, but at least a protocol defining your incentive being early, their incentive being late and following you, but still defined, clear cut, right? And that's how we can build the new creator economy, the new Web3 economy in itself, not just a project, where wealth is distributed, where wealth is actively managed between communities, where people are, are sort of making money out of their passion. So I would, I would stop this passion topic here. I'll go back to the agenda. Um, related topics. So two um, quick answers, I mean questions. Where do, you see, where do you see DeFi, Metaverse, and GameFi in one year? So from our perspective, everything centers around non-fungible tokens from our view. That's because NFTs represent digital ownership. Now that doesn't mean in the same way when you talk about liquidity. DeFi to us is banking. It's economic infrastructure. NFTs to us is property, right? And GameFi is really just an element in where we activate and enter the world. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a job or it's an activity, but that in themselves is the onboarding. So GameFi will onboard, you know, millions of users. I check our own projection is that in the next 18 to 24 months, we should expect hundreds of millions of users to be entering basically the blockchain world through gaming. But the value part, the part where people, you know, is the ownership, right? Playing a game is not what's special. Owning the assets, that's what's special, right? So non-fungible tokens is meaningful. And then DeFi is the mechanism that supports basically ownership. But, you know, for us, is not the main reason. Ten years ago, the main reason that people entered into blockchain was maybe because of Bitcoin, because they were trying to own digital assets that might have a value, right? But in the last year and a half, most people join blockchain because of culture, because of NFTs. It started with art, then it came with gaming, or with ownership of land, you know, things like Sandbox, for instance. Those were the areas where people have come on board, and we think that trend is just going to continue to accelerate. Okay, so that actually fails the next three questions. But I'll still put one of them. What do you, th what do you see will be bigger in the next one, two, and five years? DeFi, Metaverse or uh, GameFi? So Metaverse to us is the all-encompassing. In other words, it's the economy as a whole. We don't want to measure the future of these companies based on a P&L, which is a traditional way of looking at it. We want to measure it in terms of a GDP. For instance, if you look at the layer one or layer two, you can't look at you know, Ethereum as a blockchain and say its value is defined by how much gas it generates. <laughs> right? That's not how you look at it, right? Instead, you look at its utility, how, the economic activity, the size of things that happen, how many people are using it, how many people are developing it, and that's healthy, for instance. So the same is for the metaverse. So the metaverse is the all-encompassing picture, but still in the next five years, GameFi is going to be the one that's onboarding everyone into it, but I go back to digital ownership, right? Everything centers around that. So thematically, it's metaverse, but practically, 
it's digital ownership, so non-fungible tokens. You think that will be the biggest economy? Well, let's, let me put it in the physical terms. Mario from an, would be so happy. From, a, from an economic standpoint, where is a lot of the value? It's in our assets or that we own physically. It's in our houses or it's in the things we own and the clothes we buy and the culture that we have, right? You know, that's actually how we engage as humans. The reason why we think it's going to be the biggest thing is because as people, we define ourselves by our ownership. When I buy clothes, for instance, or when I buy a car, or when I buy a house, or when I choose to live in a certain area, I'm not doing it only for utility. Those clothes you're wearing, those shoes you're buying, you don't buy them because they make you run faster. You buy them because you like the brand, or you like the story, or it says something about you. That is all of our consumption in human behavior. It doesn't have to be expensive. It just has to say something about you. You buy it because it says something about you. And the digital world, we think, is exactly the same, which is why we believe non-fungible tokens is that representation of that ownership in our digital world. So I, I, I would admit openly, this is, a, this is a complete, not complete, but a partial antithesis of what we have been working on. Yes, I believe on the IP side of it. Yes, I believe in the power of NFTs through access, through utilities. I just don't believe in the JPEG, J, JPGs, but you did address that to some extent, and I do understand that. Um, so that's that. Let's, let's go towards the closure, which is a pretty casual question. What is the favorite top topic of discussion of, of, of you know, of you with people when you're sitting casually, let's say in India, we do it in chai corners. We sit in the street side chai corners and we just do whatever shit we got to, right? We talk about our favorite topics. Mostly for us, it's DeFi. What's, what is your casual favorite topic of discussion these days? I think that's off script, but anyway, <laughs> but anyway, no, no, no. Um, my favorite topic has been typically, I love to talk about philosophy. In particular... Okay. Uh, when are you coming for breakfast then? No, no, no. <laughs> Three hours breakfast? No, but it's because, um, I mean, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so attracted to Web3. It seems very compatible to that thinking because we think of blockchain not as a technical solution. We think of blockchain as a socioeconomic political system, right? Openness, transparency, it's a very libertarian way of thinking, but it's actually a political system, which is also one of the reasons we think that a certain part of the world has such an anti-reaction to blockchain too. Because, not necessarily because of the technology, they might criticize the technology, but what they actually are criticizing is its political implications. Not everyone agrees with a strong libertarian perspective. Not everyone agrees with the kind of openness and transparency. Some people believe that you need to have more control. That's also called capitalism. Stuff. No, but, but, I, so, but for instance, we think blockchain also can alter capitalism too, in a positive way. We've gone from a world of shareholder capitalism, which has been very extractive, but Web3 and blockchain actually really personifies stakeholder capitalism, where it's not just the shareholders and the owners and the runners of the companies that benefit, but every participant, right? If you are an owner of a PFP or Board Ape or Sandbox Land, you're not just a customer, you're a customer owner. You're actually a stakeholder in the system as well, and you get to benefit if the entire system benefits as well. So I think there's many aspects of this, and you know, it's a topic of personal interest, and I spend a lot of time sort of reading philosophy, discussing it with friends. Um, may be a little boring for some people, but anyway, that's how I spend my time. This is absolute resonance to a lot of people standing here, by the way, because um, one of the things we have changed is that we don't do business meetings in Dubai. We call people home, the, the players of the ecosystem, and we take two hour slot because most of the people that end up coming there are working in crypto because of the philosophical angle. And we barely discuss business for five minutes. People like Melanie in front of me, people like Mario, I don't know, so many people, Christina. I don't think uh, the, the, these guys represent the top brands in the space, but we don't talk business most of the times. It's just philosophies. And I, and I think that any business leader has to be philosophically strong and should know the ultimate vision because the road is not clear. The only thing you know is the target, is the achievement, right? You have to live the road. There are many pivots, many edges that you have to face. So what you have to believe is a philosophy. 
Thank you. Um, that's everything. I think we have run a bit over time. A big round of applause Thank you. for Yad. I tremendously love this conversation. Uh, any closing comments for the audience? Well, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. And keep building. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We'll take a minute to... So in TD5, we do a lot of things uh, that are unorthodox. Um, it is not an award. It is just an acknowledgement of being a crypto evangelist. It's a, it's a semi-precious stone, chakra tree, it heals your energy. I don't want to be a commercial advertiser of the product, but uh, we just want you to be healthy and, all the, and so for all the crypto evangelists in the space. Thank you so much for being an awesome leader of the space.